Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch with me, your host, Vikas Varu. On the 26th of July, two BSF personnel, Head Constable Shishupal Singh and Head Constable Samala Ram Vishnoi, who were part of MUNESCO, the United Nations peacekeeping mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, were killed during a protest in an eastern town near the border with Uganda. This tragic incident has brought renewed focus on the role of peacekeepers and the urgent need to ensure their safety and security. So in this episode, we will focus on United Nations peacekeeping. What do UN peacekeepers do? How has peacekeeping evolved over the years? And how is India contributing to UN peacekeeping? The Charter of the United Nations authorizes the United Nations Security Council to take collective action to maintain international peace and security. And as part of this mandate, the Security Council deploys peacekeepers in regions of conflict to provide security as well as political and peace-building support. The UN peacekeepers are known as Blue Helmets or Blue Berets. They consist of soldiers and military officers, police officers and civilian personnel drawn from the member countries of the United Nations which decide to voluntarily contribute to UN peacekeeping. The UN began its peacekeeping efforts in 1948 when it deployed military observers to West Asia. The peacekeeping mission's role was to monitor the armistice agreement between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Since that initial foray, UN peacekeepers have undertaken 70 more field missions in regions across the world, ranging from El Salvador to East Timor, with contributions from 125 countries. Currently, there are more than 80,000 personnel serving on 12 peace operations in three continents. Over the years, additional responsibilities have been given to peacekeepers. Today's multidimensional peacekeeping operations are called upon not only to maintain peace and security, but also to facilitate the political process, protect civilians, assist in the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration of former combatants, support the organization of elections, protect and promote human rights, assist in restoring the rule of law, and bolster social development that will bring positive economic change. The three basic principles that guide the UN's peacekeeping missions are consent of the parties, impartiality, and non-use of force except in self-defense and defense of the mandate. India has a long history of service in UN peacekeeping, having contributed more personnel than any other country. India's tangible contribution to UN efforts to maintain global peace and security began with its participation in the UN operation in Korea in the 1950s, where India's mediatory role in resolving the stalemate over prisoners of war led to the signing of the armistice that ended the Korean War. That early success led the UN to entrust Indian armed forces with subsequent peace missions in the Middle East, Cyprus and the Congo. To date, more than 253,000 Indians have served in 49 of the 71 UN peacekeeping missions established around the world. These include missions in some of the harshest and most insecure environments, including the Golan Heights, Somalia, South Sudan and DRC. 177 Indian peacekeepers have made the ultimate sacrifice while serving with the UN, the highest by any country. Currently, there are 5,581 Indian troops and police personnel deployed in 9 out of 12 existing UN peacekeeping missions, making India the third largest troop contributing country. India has also provided and continues to provide eminent force commanders for UN missions. Till date, India has had 17 force commanders to various missions, as well as two military advisors to the Secretary General of the United Nations. India has a long tradition of sending women on UN peacekeeping missions. In 1960, women serving in the Indian Armed Forces Medical Services were deployed to the Republic of the Congo. And in 2007, India became the first country to deploy an all-women contingent to a UN peacekeeping mission. The formed police unit in Liberia provided 24-hour guard duty and conducted night patrols in the capital Monrovia and helped not only to build the capacity of the Liberian police, but became role models for the women of Liberia, many of whom joined the security sector. 
India has also deployed field hospitals, medical units, engineering units, veterinarians, vocational trainers, and even yoga instructors to assist in peace building efforts. To learn more about the nuts and bolts of UN peacekeeping and India's role in it, I am joined by two of the best experts possible. Speaking to us from Hyderabad is Ambassador Sayyid Akbaruddin. He dealt very closely with UN peacekeeping during his tenure as India's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York from 2015 to 2020. He is currently Dean of the Kautilya School of Public Policy in Hyderabad. And joining us from Mumbai is Lieutenant General Shailesh Tenaikar. He had an illustrious career in the armed forces spanning over 38 years, during which he acquired rich experience in United Nations peacekeeping. First, as a military observer in the United Nations Angola Verification Mission, then as Chief Operations Officer in the United Nations Mission in Sudan, and finally, as the Force Commander of the United Nations Mission in South Sudan, where he served from July 2019 till February 2022. Let me begin with you, General Tenaikar. The International Day of UN Peacekeepers is observed every year on the 29th of May to honor the courage, service, and sacrifice of the United Nations Blue Helmets. Why is United Nations peacekeeping important, and how has it evolved over the years? Well, peacekeeping is one of the most effective tools available to the United Nations in the promotion and maintenance of international peace and security. It is a remarkable enterprise of multilateralism and international solidarity. From Sierra Leone to Cambodia, Timor-Leste, Namibia and Cyprus, United Nations peacekeeping has helped countries stabilize and transit from war to peace. Today, there are 90,000 peacekeepers deployed in 12 operations around the globe. The four large missions in Africa, in Democratic Republic of Congo, in Central African Republic, Mali, and South Sudan, have each a budget of more than one billion US dollars and have a formidable mission: establish a secure environment to further political, economic, and social stability as the states recover from brutal internal conflicts and move towards peace and prosperity. Ambassador Akbaruddin. Can you take us through the process by which UN peacekeepers are deployed? How does it all begin? Let's uh, begin uh, with understanding the conceptual basis. Peacekeeping is a practical innovation. There is no reference to peacekeeping in the UN Charter. It's a diplomatic tool that diplomats have evolved to maintain peace on the ground while they arrive at a larger diplomatic solution. Uh, let's also make it very clear what it is not. It is not war fighting. It uses military instrumentalities for political and diplomatic goals. That when there is a dispute, only when the parties to that dispute, whether it's intra-state or interstate, agree that they want are willing to try the path of a negotiated outcome. So sometimes. This happens through a peace agreement. Sometimes it's on the path towards the peace agreement that they agree that we should do it. So that's where it begins with the willingness of the parties to try and settle these things specifically or through peaceful means. Now, uh, if we say where it begins formally beyond this, these parties have to then approach the UN Secretariat through the Secretary General that they are ready to uh, uh, agree on a terms for involving the UN's operation there. And every UN operation has to be mandated by the UN Security Council. So in a formal sense, peacekeeping operations begin by a Security Council uh, resolution. You come up with resolutions after intensive negotiations, uh, which have multiple mandates. There are, sure, uh, there is, it's an expensive proposition in terms of money, as General Tineke mentioned, that the top four uh, peacekeeping operations cost more than a billion. But you need to see it in the context of the challenge. Let's take the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there are, uh, there, it is in the news uh, recently. 
Now, it's a country of 100 million uh, people, approximately 100 million people. And the deployment is over vast areas. Uh, even if it is limited in the country, it's over vast areas. And I just did a rough calculation preparing for your show that it amounts to one soldier for 158 square miles. Hmm. Now, you can look at the challenge that the peacekeeper is facing. Now, General Tenaikar, the UN deploys both military units as well as police units. What are the different roles they perform? You see, police units uh, are known as uh, form police units and they are predominantly meant for count control. And obviously, when uh, that happens, when the state does not have capacity to uh, regulate its own crowds, they also form the first line of resistance when UN uh, installations and property uh, are, are at risk or are threatened with contingencies of rioting, looting, as witnessed recently here in, in Congo, mm. where uh, we lost two uh, Indian peacekeepers. UN police are also there in their individual capacity. And in that, they have a training and advisory role where they train the local policemen in various criminal uh, procedures and also have an overall uh, role of building, in, building up local law and order agencies. Military combat units are principally designed to protect civilians. And this happens when there is imminent danger of violence. They are, of course, mandated to use deadly force if necessary, as you correctly stated in your introductory talk, uh, either in self-defense or the defense of the mandate. But this happens uh, following very well-defined and promulgated rules of engagement. In addition, because obviously any opening of fire is very deeply scrutinized by the international mm -hmm. community as well as by human rights organizations. And if fire has to be opened, it has to be opened as per specific rules of engagement. And if you ever, and there are uh, allegations now that peacekeepers have killed uh, two civilians as we read about in Monosco. And if at all the peacekeepers are faulted for killing civilians uh, and disobeying or disregarding rules of eng engagement, they would come in for real heavy criticism. And that reflects again on the United Nations. Ambassador Akbaruddin, women have played a very important role in UN peacekeeping. What unique perspective do they bring to the table? So, uh, you're right. Um, the importance of uh, women's engagement and leadership in peace and reconciliation process is now fairly well established. It uh, dates back to a UN uh, Security Council resolution on women, peace and security, which was, I think, a resolution 1325 uh, adopted in 2000. Now, since then, us, uh, there is a focus on trying to have more women engaged in peace and security. So what do they bring to the table? First of all, we need to acknowledge that peacekeepers operate uh, amongst local communities. And having peacekeeping units reflecting gender diversity is important to engender confidence in the local population. When you are dealing with local populations consisting of diverse genders, it's normal to have that. Number two, it builds trust amongst vulnerable groups, uh, such as women and children, because they open up much more. I'm certain General Tanekar will tell you that when women uh, engagement units go, they get more information also, uh, because uh, it's a good way of uh, uh, gaining better insights of what the local population is thinking. And finally, uh, we all acknowledge that uh, uh, vulnerable groups like women, like children, tend to get affected more adversely mm -hmm. in a conflict situation. And having a gender perspective is helpful in crafting peace building outcomes, uh, which will take their concerns into uh, account also. Otherwise, it's possible that those concerns may be neglected. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, better inputs will help be uh, decision making. Uh, in difficult environments. Finally, uh, I think uh, there is another important factor which we should not forget, and that was they act as role models in these societies. Correct. And I remember uh, the former uh, Liberian president, uh, um, Ellen Johnson, president, uh, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She always mentioned many times how the Indian women police unit had 
change the thinking of Liberian women because they had never seen women being deployed in security roles. She said just their visible presence guarding the presidential palace had such an impact uh, on uh, Liberian women. They also realized that they could do such roles and it played an important role in enhancing gender equality in that society. Yeah. So I think they play multiple roles. Uh, it's on the increase. My understanding is when I started following peacekeeping in the 90s, there were 1% of uh, 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 units which had women. Uh, today, I understand they are about 5%, 4.5 to 5%. The goal is about 15% for units and 20% or 25% for individuals. Uh, General Tenaikar, you have served as force commander in South Sudan, the largest and one of the most complex UN peacekeeping missions till date. So you have first-hand experience of the situation on the ground. Tell us, what are the kind of threats that UN peacekeepers face? See, uh, UN peacekeepers invariably, as you uh, correctly pointed out, operate in a very dangerous and a volatile situation. Where the parties to the conflict uh, are very often coerced into signing an agreement. And hence, there is a tendency to violate its principal clauses, uh, 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 clauses so that either they are able to retain or rest power and influence. Uh, so threats to peacekeepers operating in an unstable and unpredictable environment, as I, uh, as I pointed out, are really multi uh, multifarious. Firstly, there is always a possibility of being perceived to be taking sides in a politically sensitive situation. Their neutrality may not be recognized by armed groups outside who there are there could be a number of armed groups operating outside the peace framework in in such in such kind of states protection of civilians from imminent danger will always uh, place peacekeepers in the line of fire and when such a contingency happens uh, you know, there would obviously be casualties which are again very sensitive because many nations uh, it it possibly affects the kind of uh, public opinion in respective countries Politically motivated rioting against peacekeepers, as we have seen in Congo, by a mixed mob of armed and unarmed civilians is a serious threat. And that basically, if it ever happens, it strikes at the very basis of UN deployment. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Akbaruddin, Article 44 of the UN Charter provides for the Security Council to undertake consultations with troop contributing countries before embarking on a field operation. But in practice, this rarely happens. Why is it important for troop contributing countries to have a say in the mandate of the mission they are volunteering for? There are multiple reasons. Uh, first is, of course, the legal injunction that you mentioned. But there is also a moral requirement that if you ask a country to put their soldiers' uh, lives at the cutting edge, uh, then they need to be consulted. Uh, but that's not the only reason. There is a moral reason, there are legal reasons, but there's also practical requirement. Troop contributors have ground level knowledge. They can, they are not only boots on the ground, mm. they can function as the UN's eyes and ears. So it will be good to find a, a channel of communication which will give you inputs of what is happening on the ground. So for a multiple uh, uh, requirements of legal, moral, practical, I think it will be useful. Uh, finally, uh, if peacekeeping is a collective endeavor, where all stakeholders should speak from the same hymn sheet, then you need to have um, uh, troop contributing countries with large number of troops on the ground uh, to also contribute and be consulted. Otherwise, you're wasting a resource that is available to you. General Tanaykar, now India has lost the maximum number of peacekeepers, 177. What more can be done to ensure their safety and security? First is, well, obviously, more training, better preparation, and that definitely saves lives. Peacekeeping is, is very, very different from counterinsurgency operations or aid to civil authorities. It was brought out by Ambassador Akbaruddin. And it requires a completely distinct orientation to operate effectively. And hence, I feel that there is possibly a requirement of an independent or a separate uh, training institute, which regularly trains uh, soldiers, troops, contingents on the intricacies of peacekeeping operations. There is a scope also to improve personal and contingent security equipment incorporating latest technology. It must be more uh, mission specific. It must be responsive to foreseen and probable uh, risks within bases and also well out on patrol. 
you had an incident in Congo. I think that needs to be investigated post haste. And lessons need to be promulgated across all missions so that necessary remedial actions are immediately put to use. There are also steps taken to enhance situational awareness and gather intelligence. And these are turning out to be effective. These measures would warn uh, peacekeepers of risks and dangers that lie ahead to enable uh, appropriate preemptive action and thereby prevent casualties. Ambassador Akbaruddin, now turning to India's role. Why did India take to UN peacekeeping in such a big way, contributing the highest number of troops? So, uh, India sees uh, peacekeeping as a global public good. Uh, it sees this as a tangible contribution to global public, uh, global peace and security. Uh, it's a reflection of India's willingness to shoulder uh, global responsibilities also. Uh, let's uh, acknowledge that we have a long tradition. It's a tradition which is now 75 years, as old as the UN. Um, let us not forget that the first Param Veer Chakra uh, uh, of, uh, awarded to an Indian national outside for services outside India's borders was to Captain Saleria. Mm. Uh, and this goes back to 1961 in the Congo. Uh, so we have a long tradition. It's also symbolic of our own commitment uh, to a civilizational ethos of Vasudeva Kudumakam that we think the whole world is a family and if there is a need for support for some parts of the world, we should stand up and be supportive. So it's a tradition we are proud of. It's a tradition we should continue to nurture. Taking off from what Ambassador Akbaruddin just said, General, why are Indian peacekeepers so highly valued? Well, firstly, Indian peacekeepers, I think, embody the values of our society. And these essentially are unity and diversity, a spirit of tolerance, democratic values that we bring, recognition of religious freedoms, a firm belief in justice, equality, human dignity, and rule of law. And of course, Indians present an excellent example of a plural, inclusive, stable, and growth-oriented society. And that matters when that matters how, how the globe or the international community views an Indian peacekeeper. The military itself is prided for its discipline, its responsiveness, and risk-taking abilities in critical situations. And that reflects its professional ethos. Police personnel have made a mark through their training and advisory skills, empathy, and deep knowledge in dealing with law and order situations of differing complexities. But above all, I feel all Indian peacekeepers, military as well as police, are defined by their unique ability to form lasting bonds of friendship and association, bridging cultural and social uh, diversities. There is a willingness to suffer privations and work with enthusiasm, commitment and passion for the commit for the benefit of communities most in need. Ambassador Akbaruddin, now some strategists feel that being one of the largest troop contributing countries may help India's claim for permanent membership of the Security Council. Is there any link between the two? So, because um, India's claim uh, to being a permanent member of the Security Council um, far exceeds our role in peacekeeping. I acknowledge that peacekeeping is an important aspect. And that is, I think, many strategists link it to the non-permanent membership. Because uh, if you look at the UN Charter, I think Article 23 says that due regard should be given for non-permanent membership in the first instance to contribution to the maintenance of international peace and security, and so the link. But there is no criteria laid down in the UN Charter for permanent membership. And I would think that India is a sui generis country of a billion plus people who are bound together as a democracy. There is no other parallel in human history, not now, but in human history of such numbers wanting to function as a democracy. It's simply that if the UN says uh, we are a organization which look towards we, we reflect the will of we the people that 1.3 billion people are adequate reason for India to be on the Security Council. Uh, so there are many other reasons also on account of our uh, promotion of uh, global issues. We can go back and look at decolonization uh, where we played the lead. Uh, bringing in apartheid to the UN uh, General Assembly, where we took the lead on issues of economic, now on issues of social justice, on climate change, 
there are no global solutions possible without india Absolutely. so i think india's aspiration to be a permanent member uh, is based on multiple things and peacekeeping is certainly one of those general tanaykar working as a peacekeeper requires very specialized training as you pointed out how is india contributing to training for un peacekeeping and helping other countries get into peacekeeping for the very first time well india has a very vibrant active uh, center for un peacekeeping in new delhi and that is really actively involved in training both military and police personnel not only from the country but also from about 18 to 20 uh, partner partnering countries recently um, there were two courses that have been conducted and that was after a, a long gap of of covid mm. and that was basically pre deployment training and un national investigation officer uh, which was again uh, 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 done with partnership of the us state department i would like to add the importance given to it to these courses where the foreign secretary himself does uh, is a, a keynote speaker for valid valedictory sessions of for, of both these courses recently i may like to add that kazakhstan has deployed a company of 150 peacekeepers with the indian battalion in lebanon under its command guiding its military as it takes its initial steps uh, participating in un peacekeeping joint deployment also signals a new phase of military cooperation between both be, between both our countries we have also been training uh, and preparing a company of uh, royal bhutanese army yes. for rapid deployment finally ambassador akbaruddin how would you sum up india's overall approach to peacekeeping so india is a key uh, supporter of uh, un peacekeeping but it also recognizes that the world is changing and we need to adjust our tools uh, so uh, uh, we need greater funding as was said greater safety uh, greater uh, better equipment and more realistic mandates mm. uh, because uh, without realistic mandates we will never be true to the cardinal principles that have made peacekeeping such a success and you've pointed out at the beginning that these principles are consent of the parties concerned impartiality um, non use of force uh, all these except in the defense of the mandate or in accordance with the mandate so all these are what have made peacekeeping a success but today at times peacekeeping is pushed into a no man's land uh, between trying to keep the peace in fragile environments and trying to enforce the maintenance of peace where there is no peace to keep so uh, we need to really look at this tendency to push the frontiers uh, and because we may lose the essence of peacekeeping it's a unique tool um, uh, it's a tool that needs to be used in a calibrated manner with proper political guidance and brought to a closure at an early day a date because it is too precious a tool to be blunted by using it repeatedly as a solution for all ills it is not a solution for all ills it is a specific tool for specific purposes and that's how it needs to be looked at nurtured and cherished thank you very much ambassador akbaruddin and general tenaikar for your brilliant insights as the world faces new threats to security it needs peacekeepers to keep the peace and protect the vulnerable india remains firmly committed to un peacekeeping but has been urging the international community to grasp the rapid changes that are underway in the nature and role of contemporary peacekeeping operations the security council's mandate to un peacekeeping operation need to be rooted in ground realities and adequately resourced above all there must be better security for un peacekeepers attacks against them must be investigated and the perpetrators brought to justice that is all i have for you in this edition of diplomatic dispatch thank you for watching and goodbye